Phil Armstrong and Kara Golden. Uh, most of you know Phil. We're glad to have Phil back to talk to us. Phil's originally from Ohio, but he's been in Tulsa over 20 years now. Uh, he serves on several nonprofit boards, including uh, chairing the Greenwood Cultural Center Board and serving as project director on the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission. He currently serves as president and CEO of the Oklahoma Center for Community and Justice, OCCJ. And today he's going to, he and, uh, and Kara are both going to speak to us on what uh, projects OCCJ is working on and maybe how we can help. So with that, I'll call you up here. Come on, Phil. Let's welcome Phil. Good morning. Let's start out with something worshipful. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you, oh my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear and let it be a sweet sweet sound in your ear i love you lord and i lift my voice just to worship you Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear, and let it be a sweet, sweet sound. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound. Lord, let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Amen. 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 It is so wonderful to be back, to be invited back again. Um, I, uh, am, and I do not take that lightly at all. And the last time I was here last year, it was fresh off of the heels of the project of Greenwood Rising. And I think I'd been with OCCJ maybe a month. And I told Kara earlier, I said, I didn't know what I was talking about. Uh, but I was saying it, you know. Uh, and uh, it's great to finally have time and experience and learning. Uh, at February 6th uh, was my one year anniversary. Um, taking over the role, and it's been an incredible, incredible journey. And um, I want to uh, thank Bill. Uh, Bill reached out again and, and for being so accommodating and nice. And we had an, a date for February, and uh, a very close college friend, a 30 year friendship, suddenly had a massive heart attack uh, the, the week before. And many people. Uh, that went to school with him gathered in Dallas on the exact same day that I was supposed to be here. So thank you for shifting and making the accommodation for that and still saying, we'll still have you back. So thank you for that. Thank you for the leadership of this class and this church. Uh, I went to go see Kelly to say hi, but I, I couldn't find him. So I left him in a note. I said, uh, your brother from another mother just stopped by to say hi. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully he'll get that note. Um, uh, I want to start with this, and then we'll get right into this so I can bring Kara up and give her as much time as possible. Uh, one of my favorite verses, my mom taught me this, I think I was maybe seven years old, one of the first Bible verses she had me memorize. King James Version, Psalm 133 and 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers, and in today's modern vernacular, I think it's okay to say brethren and sisterin, to gather together in unity. Um, the Greek word koinonia, koinonia, it's a Greek word, etymology, and it simply means the Christian fellowship of a body of believers. So I am grateful to be a part of this koinonia this morning. 
Um, in that same vein, um, the Oklahoma Center for Community and Justice, as you see there, uh, statewide organization, if you go to the next uh, uh, slide there, I don't know if you're clipping there, this is the team. Um, we are a small, and when you say a statewide, and you see six people up there, we are statewide, at, but a incredibly nimble team. I tell them this all the time. I don't know, I think they sometimes think I'm just saying things to say things, but they are some of the most intelligent uh, young uh, humans that I have ever been around. Um, and I learned so much from them. Um, from uh, your left all the way to the right where I'm standing, uh, our newest member, his name is Taz Neem. He goes by Taz. He's our manager of community engagement in Oklahoma City. Uh, and pretty much he's there uh, in Oklahoma City uh, carrying the work of OCJ there and growing our brand and, and what we're trying to reach there. Uh, and then next to him is Morgan Allen White. She is our Director of Fund Development. And then you'll hear from her in just a moment uh, in the beautiful green dress there. That is Kara Golden, who is our Director of Programming. Next to her is Victoria uh, Dangtunda von Eitzigen. And I took about two weeks to learn how to say that correctly. Uh, because it na saying the names correctly was um, important to me, but she's our programming coordinator. And then Shadi Nari, she is amazing. She's like the backbone of our office. She's our office administrator. And then yours truly. The next slide uh, simply talks about a little bit of the history of OCCJ. Um, believe it or not, 1934, and this is 2024, 1934, it started out, some of you will remember this name, NCCJ, the National Conference of Christians and Jews. That's how long this organization has been around. Now the vernacular and the name changed uh, back in 2002, but the work and the mission has stayed and remained the same. And NCCJ affiliates and chapters actually spread out all across the country. Tulsa was established in 1958, um, and I will say that a uh, friend and mentor to us all at the office and has become a great and wonderful friend of mine, uh, Miss Nancy Day, who was the president and CEO uh, of, the, of the office that got staffed here many years ago. 33 years, 33 years she ran NCCJ and oversaw the transition to OCCJ. Uh, and I will say this because no other chapter, no other affiliate had this much success. When the national model fell apart, and the national model being uh, you raise money locally, and then you write a check, and it goes to New York City. Uh, and you can imagine, uh, over time, people just didn't like that. Uh, and I think that was kind of the downfall. Uh, but the headquarters was in New York City. And Nancy Day would raise money and have annual fundraisers, and, but you'd write a check, and she told me, and you, she, you can imagine putting all these checks together, putting it in an envelope, and shipping it to New York City, you know. Uh, but in 2002, when they said, you know, our national headquarters office are, are going to discontinue, you can continue the work, but it's up to you in your individual locales to raise money, to create your own entity, to try to keep the work going. Oklahoma was one of the only states that was able to raise as much money in an eight-month period. Uh, Oklahoma, corporations, companies, churches, individuals, interfaith community, they raised over $600,000 to keep to make sure that it would not go away. Uh, and that's, uh, that's, that's really a testament to her and to the work of OCCJ. Uh, and since that time, it's becoming transition from NCCJ to OCCJ. And then the last point there, emphasis on our programs and initiatives that reach a broad range of ages. Um, at this point, um, our focus this year is to really promote the 30th anniversary of Anytown. It used to be Camp Anytown, and now it's Anytown Leadership Institute. Um, there's nothing greater that I've been able to witness in the year that I've been here than to see young high school students between the age of 14 and 18, um, and we strategically, Carol get into the details, but we st strategically want to find students that may not ever have a situation where they would cross paths with somebody different from themselves, whether uh, their identity, their religious affiliation, their racial affiliation, whether they live in deep North Tulsa or live in deep South Tulsa, it brings students together and it literally transforms their lives to learn how to live in community with one another, love one another, respect one another, and build and be a positive force for change. It radically has changed 
over a thousand people who have gone through any town and they still remember they will this is our 30th anniversary reaching out to alumni to talk about this is the 30th year we want to bring you back we want you to uh, celebrate this 30 year and they will remember to the detail I remember my first day I remember my experience I remember the last day when we're crying and we don't want to leave and it's just one week so today I want to bring up our director of programming to really get into because we need we need OCCJ now more than ever. When you think about what happened in Owasso with Next Benedict, we know that the investigation has determined that um, their death was not due to trauma, but what is undeniable is that Next Benedict was the victim of continual bullying because of how she chose to, how they chose to identify. And that is where OCCJ and the work of OCJ steps in to get these young people for whatever they're hearing in their homes. Kids don't wake up thinking these things. They don't not born. They hear it. They hear it at the kitchen table. They hear it from their mothers and fathers and memaws and pawpaws. And they go to school and they act out the environment that they hear. And there has to be something to stop that. There has to be something that says that's wrong. And you don't have to agree, but you've got to learn to love your neighbor and to respect the individual identities and, and differences that we have and learn how to live in community. With that, I want to bring up someone who I am learning from, who is just the driving force of our entire office and staff, and she keeps these programs going. I want you to hear now from our director of programming, Ms. Kara Golden. Okay. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to hand these to Miss Judy. Oh, okay. So um, when we were printing those, they scratched a little bit, so the color is a little bit off, so apologies for that. And I don't know if I have enough for every single person in the room, so also apologies for that. But we will be connecting with Bill and or Hank to get you all some flyers that are nice and pretty, plenty for everyone, and you can share them around. Um, but before I get too deep into the weeds, I just want to introduce myself. You all know Phil and have heard from him, um, but my name is Kara Golden. I, again, serve as the program director at OCCJ. I'm not from Tulsa, not from Oklahoma. I moved here about three years ago. It'll be three years on May 31st. Um, to work for this organization. I had been previously at the Southern Poverty Law Center, if any of you are familiar with that, or that Sparks and Bells, working in communications with them. But it was too far away from people um, that I was writing about and all of the press releases and all the communications that we were sending out. And um, I wanted to get a little bit closer and engage with the people. So I really enjoy talking to people like this. Um, I really enjoy talking to youth in particular. I always say that young people are the only real hope that we have for positive change. Um, and so I love that our organization does so much work with youth. Um, feel free to ask me anything as we go forward. Don't want you to feel like you're interrupting me. Um, typically when thoughts come to mind, you can have a thought and then you can lose it if you wait too long to ask. So feel free to just raise a hand if you all have a question. Okay, any thoughts initially? Yes. Correct. It has always been with our organization and or other NCCJs. So National Conference of Christian and Jews prior to uh, the dissolution that Phil was talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if my, okay, perfect. So that is our wonderful picture of last year's Anytown. Um, you see Phil down there making a lovely, beautiful face. <laughs> and then I actually took this picture, so I'm behind the camera. I prefer that kind of style, actually. I love the antinomity of what I get to do most of the time. I like to talk to people, but I also like to put the pieces together, do the curriculum, the logistics, and then I get to bring all of the kids together, and they have this amazing experience. And then I'm not, like there, you know, it's just, they're, they're experiencing it, and it's just really precious for me to, it's an honor, really, that I get to participate in creating this transformative experience for them. Um, so who has heard of Anytown prior to any connection with Phil or myself? Wonderful. Okay. Good things, I hope? Okay. So in general, Anytown is a seven-day overnight program. Um, before it was held at Stillwater, we would take the young people to camps across the state. 
Many of the camps were sponsored by churches, other religious organizations. Um, the last one that we were at was at Camp Crispin's. Um, I can't remember how far away that is from here, but about an hour maybe, give or take, hour 30 minutes or so. Um, we tried to keep it kind of close to both Tulsa and Oklahoma City because as Phil was saying, OCCJ, NCCJ has been statewide for the longest time and we try and get as many students from everywhere as we possibly can, right? So now we take our youth to OSU in Stillwater. Um, they get to stay in the dorms for a week. They get to experience what it's like to go to college um, in addition to meeting people who they would have never otherwise met. An example, last year, is she in this picture? Of course she is. Okay, let's see if my clicker will point her out. Okay, this is Rahima Sadat. Um, she's from Afghanistan. She actually moved here in the course of the Afghan refugee crisis um, in 2021. I actually had dinner with her last night. It was wonderful to catch up and see how she was doing. But all of these other kiddos, so we had some from Idabel, Oklahoma, way down south, right here, right here, right here. Oh, no, not her. That's Genesis. Let's see. A few others, uh, for all the way from Idabel, and then Rahima from Afghanistan, and then we've got some folks from Tulsa, all coming together. Never would have otherwise probably met or had a conversation. And we're talking together, all of these different people in a room, about all of these different topics. So hate and extremism, what that looks like, as we kind of recognize the fourth anniversary of um, January 6th, for example. Um, and then also the incident with Next Benedict, so many other things, right? Um, bullying, um, gender identity, immigration, leadership, race, um, privilege, what that looks like, and the connection to allyship, so how we can show up for ourselves and how we can show up for others in our communities, right? Um, and I always say that I provide the curriculum, I provide the structure and the log logistics, but the meaningful part of any town I believe truly, the magic, that's what people describe it as to me, is when all of these young people who never would have otherwise met each other, they're coming together and having these conversations, many of them for the first time. And there's something really powerful in that raw, like, I have a question, let me ask you, and you have a question, let me ask you, and neither of us really know the answer, but we're dialoguing together and really processing it out together. It's kind of like um, planting a seed for a thought, for a perspective change, and then someone else later on, because the program's only a week long, right? But someone else later on comes along, and they're able to water that seed, they're able to give it some sunshine, and it blooms into something beautiful, transformative in that youth's life, right? So I think that ultimately, that's kind of a long spiel about what any town is and what it does, right? Um, but like I said, it's seven days overnight, um, so we really get to know the youth. Um, like I said, I just had dinner with Rahima, um, last night, we try and stay connected with them over the course of the time after that one week and encourage them and help them to stay connected with each other as well. Any questions on that initially? Yes? Huh? Oh, <laughs> the mic. Yeah. Well, first of all, I've never heard of the word allyship, so that's yes. very interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. In your time with them, do you give them uh, pointers or tips, practicing if, you know, if they hear someone say something that is very offensive. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, all, you know, adults, we still struggle with that. Yeah. Do, do I mention, hey, that sucks, or, you know, or just let it go? I mean, do you give them ways to at least express their opinion without yes. being confronted? Yes, definitely. That's actually the whole point of the program. We don't approach anything at OCCJ, and I'm going to go through some of our other programs in a sec, but um, through a judgment perspective, like, you know, if you have a perspective um, that's maybe different from mine, we want to hear and exchange all of those different perspectives. So yes, part of that dialogue process is encouraging them to have those tools to do that dialogue. Um, actually, at the very beginning, when we're creating um, agreements for how we're going to engage with each other, we talk about the difference between dialogue and debate, and we want to encourage dialogue, and that allows an open forum for everyone to share their perspectives, and that's something that perspective, dialogue versus debate, that they take back into their communities, and they really engage in, in that. Yes, I was asking for specifics. Okay. Could one say, well, I don't understand it that way. I don't see it that way. Um, help me understand why you, why you see that way. I mean, do you give them I mean, really concrete tri tips like that? Yeah, so tools to and tricks for when, um, I'm tricks, trying to think. Tricks, yes. Tools and tricks for, yes. So I think um, part of the whole process 
for any town. Um, it's hard to think of a specific, not because there aren't specifics, but because our topics are so um, broad and because um, I think the nature of the entire experience I'll is, give you a, a, an yeah. example. I'm a <clears throat> when I was pastoring a church, one of the members mm -hmm. started talking about colored people. Okay. And of course, I don't, you know, but I didn't say anything. I didn't want to be confrontive. Okay. So, I mean, that, that's an example of, I see. you know, so and I think all we, of us perhaps have been, you know, whatever the topic is, we hear something and, you know, it's like, yes, I don't want to okay, cause I a see. problem, I'll be quiet. And then yes. you feel guilty about that. Yes, we definitely do. So in that example, we would definitely, you know, speak to the large group and say, have you all ever heard this term before? You know, and I'm sure that they would. And we would kind of talk through, okay, you know, what are your perspectives on it? How does it make you feel? We use a lot of how do you, how does it make you feel words, especially when we're in a diverse group with a lot of students, because some students, you know, they, they might not resonate at all with that word and other students might, you know, it might cause some really negative feelings. And so we create space for that to open up. And then we suggest, we don't ever try um, to tell people what to say or not say or believe or not believe, but we want to encourage inclusion, right? So making everyone feel welcome. And if, every, if there are some people in the room who feel like the word colored, you know, gives them a certain negative connotation, maybe we shouldn't use that word going forward as we're together in this space. And that's the kind of idea of how we would address that situation. But things like that do come up and we address it in that way. We talk Thank about you. it as a large group. Is that helpful? Yes. I'm sorry, it took so long to get there. <laughs> Of course, of course. Yes. Okay. Oh. oh, okay. Yeah. We have Two lots mics. of mics here. Two mics. Okay. That's I'm fine. I'm holding the mic now. Yeah. All right. Um, my question is, what do you do with the smartphones that the uh, individual will be bringing to these seven days? All right. Is it a isolation that they no longer can use their smartphones only on emergency? What are the parameters that you, uh, you know, set forth guidelines, you know, uh, during that seven days? Because that's a long time, mm -hmm. you know, to be FOMO, you yes. know? Yes, that is a fantastic question. Um, we actually do not allow cell phones at all. Um, so many times uh, they leave them at home Knowing that, um, I included, and I was just talking to Phil about this on Friday, actually. Um, uh, I actually included in many of my email exchanges and our registration form and all of our um, uh, forms that parents and youth have to sign before they come, saying that their cell phone is, they're not allowed to use it unless there is an emergency. So if they do bring their cell phone, we have them put it in a bag and we keep it with our staff. Um, and if there's emergency, of course, the young person can get the phone, turn it on, and then call whoever it is they need to call. We also have all of their um, emergency contacts as well. So if we would need to contact them, we can, we can do that as well. Yeah, great question. <laughs> I just want to give a personal experience to that. That's as a, as a, I may not look like it, thank you, Lord, but uh, my wife and I uh, have four adult grown children out of the home and out of college. Uh, but for a parent, it's actually like, wow, they don't have their cell phone for a week. That's cool, you know? <laughs> Let me give you a personal experience. My, so the, the church that I attend, uh, my wife's there now singing on the praise team is Metropolitan Baptist Church, the Met Church, Dr. Ray uh, A. Owens. Um, he, uh, seminary and trained um, uh, professor from, um, uh, not well, he teaches at Phillips. Uh, but uh, Princeton, he, he got his degree from Princeton. His daughter, who is now 23, when he signed her up, he didn't tell her, you gotta give up your cell phone. We don't recommend that you don't do that yeah. and give please that don't, trauma. Please don't, yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Yeah. But he chose to do that. But the reason I'm telling the story is that he said he remembers the day that she got there and she called him literally crying, you didn't tell me, I had to give up my cell phone, I can't believe you sent me here, you did this to me, and hung up the phone. <laughs> when she got back home, she didn't even want to use the cell phone anymore. He said, it transformed her life. She is now, she just got accepted to law school uh, in Michigan, and she wants to study uh, social justice law. As a result of the one week experience, um, and I literally saw that last year to see kids who were upset 
and Friday, literally crying, say, I don't even want to get my cell phone anymore. It is transformational. Just want to say and, and to that point, that happens a lot. I'll talk to parents after the program. And they were like, you know, I was like, you know, just checking in. How was it about the cell phone? And they were like, they didn't even use the cell phone for two, three days after they got back. You know, and when they did pick it up, they were just trying to contact the people who they went to any town with, right? So, I mean, there's, there's, um, there is that like, oh, but then it's, it's liberating. It's a recognition. I don't need this, you know, as much as I thought that I did. Yeah. What yes. is the process for selecting the students? That is a great question. So we get students from all over the state, as I said. Um, we recently, um, over the last few years, have not reached our cap limit. So our cap number of students would be about 45 kiddos. So recently, everyone who applies gets in. And that's also kind of by design because we want everyone who would apply, who would feel like they need a dose of what we, what we call it a dose of any town, that spirit of, you know, there are people here, there are adults here, here who, who support me, um, who really want to see me succeed. We would want everyone to have that experience. But if we were to get to that cap of 45, we would probably go through a selection process based on their application materials. So we have them submit a letter of recommendation, and then we have them answer. I wish I had our um, uh, application up here, but we don't. Um, we go have them go through a series of short answer questions and long answer questions about um, what experience they had in the past where they wish that they could have had you know, some of the tools that we would provide them in any town. Um, what has their experience been like with leadership in the past? And then based on some of those answers, we would have a diverse group of students that would ultimately be selected. But since pre-COVID, we have never reached 45 students, which is another reason why we're here, right? To hopefully garner that support and get some students from Harvard Ave who can come. Um, but once we would arrive at that point, that's when we would start doing that selection process. But to date, we have not needed to do that. It is $450 um, to go through, um, about half of the actual cost of putting it on for every student, but we do have full and partial scholarships for every student who would seek to apply, especially students who live in rural or non-metro communities, and especially students who attend TPS, Tulsa Public Schools. We have specific scholarships for those students, but again, we have them as well for all students who would seek to apply from other areas as well. I have a question. Yes. yes. 14 to 18 is the age limit. Mm -hmm. So could one start at 14 and go come oh. those consecutive years? Yes. No. Um, they only can go one time. One time. Only can go one time. But we do have a lot of our past delegates who come back as counselors. And we actually consider that, a, if you think of a traditional camp where you have the camp and you go as a camper and then you have the um, training where you go as in leadership, you, you know, counselor and training situation, that's kind of what we think of as our counselors who come back prior, previously who were delegates. It's like an elevated experience of any town for them because they then are responsible for um, uh, facilitating some of the curriculum for supervising the delegates for kind of giving context for their own experience to these the next generation the younger folks who are coming through um, and then we also have many of them who even go further and become advisors so this is an older group of folks who went through any town years ago and continue to come back and engage another question that I have that, yeah. and this is more for the class yeah. I have been encouraging Colt over many years to send someone to any town or to submit a name for yeah. consideration. Does anyone know if anyone has attended from Harvard Avenue? And as far as I know, we have not had anyone, but I think that's something we could definitely follow up on. Um, I just wanted to witness that my niece, Sarah Siner, attended Camp Anytown uh, from Muskogee High okay. School. And there was an incident there in their high school, a racial incident, and she called the office in Tulsa and asked for assistance, and she provided um, some uh, dialogue that helped yes. in that situation as a direct result of her attendance at Camp Anytown. That's awesome. And I'm very happy to say that my grandson, Oliver Benjamin, 
Cornelius will attend this summer. Woo! And he's very Yay! Excited. I love that. Okay. And I think that's a great example, too, of the question that was asked over here about the tools, uh, strategies around, you know, how do we address things like that. So that's a great example, too. Yes. Um, how do you get the news out about this school all over Oklahoma this year? That's a great question. So we do lots of emails, <laughs> lots of emails. Um, but I also, I and, and Phil and other members of our team, but especially me, we do a lot of talking like this to groups. Last week, um, I was in Seminole, Oklahoma, talking to um, the Academy of Seminole students. We actually get a pretty regular contingent of kiddos from there, which is great. Um, we have a partnership in the school with a couple of the uh, um, substitute teachers. And they've also come to Anytown. So that also helps, right, if there are adults who are connected to the program who can then shepherd the the youth and have more regular contact so we build those um, connections across the state and then um, I was also t talking to Tulsa Tech um, uh, teachers and advisors and administrative staff last week as well um, and then we make regular trips to Oklahoma City and our staff person Taz that Phil was referencing also makes connections specifically in Oklahoma City. So we do kind of a lot of different things. Most of our success comes from in-person conversations like this where people can actually see me and connect with me and ask me questions and ask us questions and dialogue about you know what it would take and how we can help support we, OCCJ, can help support you um, in getting students to participate. This may be a question for Phil. I hope my memory serves me correctly, but I believe when you were here uh, before, the horrible uh, incident in McCurtain County had occurred, and you told a uh, terrific story about how you connected, uh, uh, I believe, with the newspaper uh, person there. What's been the follow-up from that, or what's been the result, the impact of uh, your involvement there, the, the organization's involvement? Such an excellent question. I actually was going to hopefully had time to even talk about that. It was, it's, it's a real world experience. Um, to remind everyone who doesn't know, um, April of last year, um, the McCurtain uh, Gazette in McCurtain County, Ida Bell, Oklahoma, for not familiar with that, um, actually had a reporter who put a recording device in the room where their county commissioners have their meetings and it recorded a live interactive discussion between the elected county sheriff, the elected county commissioner, and others literally saying these words, and this is not summarizing, these are quotes, I wish we could go back to the days when we could lynch black people. Um, I, uh, other quotes were, um, you know we can make t people disappear. I've got earth moving equipment, I've got some land, we can actually bury bodies and bury, I mean, these were extensive conversations taking place. That's what took place. So fast forward, we were able to reach out. Four of us got in the car, drove down there, did a similar presentation like this, and asked parents to meet us in the library. Um, and about eight students showed up, I guess. We had four students sign up that night and came to any town. They were um, absolutely amazing. Uh, one was one or two maybe were um, African American uh, and mixed with um, Native uh, Native American Freedmen blood line, um, but there were four African American students that would never have Ida Bell's four hour drive away, um, and we even got o Oklahoma State to send a bus out there to pick them up and bring them. They were absolutely amazing that week, and the last day. The mother of one of the students drove from Ida Bell because she had to come see her baby. And when she walked in, I think you remember this, she walked in, we were singing, and this is in a Campany Town song we were singing, and all the students, and she's remembering the, the, the last time she dropped her off, and this traumatizing look like, you're leaving me here, and I can't believe I'm here type of look. And one week later, she walks through the door, and I'll never forget her looking straight at her daughter like, I don't recognize this person. And her, her daughter just Maya. singing and being vibrant with these other white and black and, 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 and students from all over the state. And she just she began. Was crying. Uh, and she was crying. I was going to say, not only is she crying, she was weeping. Mm -hmm. she, just, she was just weeping like, what have you done with my daughter? Um, and imagine them going back to Ida Bell and being the change that that community needs for that type of hate that was brought out there. That's just one example of what any town does for students around the state. Yeah. Great question. Thank you. Um, 
I, t I taught at Booker T almost 30 years, and every day it was kind of like an any town situation because there was large minority and white, white, white population together. Mm -hmm. And um, we had, in the, one of the last years I was there, there was a, a social media issue that blew up, uh, racial uh, discussion back and forth. And so they um, and it got picked up by the media too, here locally. And so we brought in, you know, like uh, facilitators, racial equality facilitators, that work with the kids in small groups. Mm -hmm. And um, the uh, and so I've reflected on that since that time because of all the uh, anti uh, DEI diversity equity inclusion talk we get from our from our state government. Mm -hmm. Uh, that has that made it more difficult for you uh, to present your services here in Oklahoma? Yes, <laughs> yes, 100%. Um, uh, but we have kind of pivoted in the way that we recruit, not just for any town, and I'm going to talk in just a second, um, maybe a couple more questions, then we'll move to the next bit. Um, but we've pivoted from how we used to recruit. We used to have a lot of partnerships in schools. So I mentioned back there to answer that question about um, our partnership with the Academy of Seminoles. Uh, 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 substitute teachers, goodness, words, hard this morning. Um, we ha don't have as many of those. We've had much more success connecting with our religious community, um, whether that's churches like this, um, or um, we have a burgeoning connection that we're building with the mosque. Um, as well as many Jewish um, congregations throughout the city. And then in, um, oh, that got louder. <laughs> um, and then also in Oklahoma City, the same is true. Um, so yes, it has made it more challenging, more difficult, um, but we're still here. We're not stopping our work. Uh, as Phil was saying, it's more important now than ever that students have safe spaces to have conversations with each other, to, you know, build up their voices, not really find it because they've got their voice already, but sometimes it's just a matter of having someone listen to them um, and validate the fact that they actually do have that voice. Um, so we're still here, we're still working, and we will continue to do so. Um, hopefully for you know the next, any town's 30 years old this year, hopefully we'll continue that for another 30 years. My yes. question is mostly to Phil, I think. Uh, Phil, uh, you know our heritage of the dialogue series that we've had, and we don't have anything comparable to that going on now, to my knowledge. Is there any plan that in Tulsa that we will be bringing our faith communities back together to be in trialogue, dialogue? Easy answer is yes, it is continuing to go on, and I'll actually have Kara actually just uh, touch that, touch on that uh, right quick on, yeah. on what we're doing with, with Interfaith Trialogue. Yep, so um, to transition a little bit from any town, so Teen Trialogue, um, we do have Teen Trialogue, um, it's the teenage version of the larger Trialogue series. Um, all, both of these programs are mostly youth-facing, uh, but we do have several other adult-facing interfaith groups that we're part of, interfaith dialogues and study groups. So after Trialogue, if you're not familiar, it was an opportunity for folks from all uh, faith traditions, mostly Jewish, Christian, Muslim, to come together and have conversation on a topic. Um, and that phased out in 2019. It was tentatively replaced by a partnership through uh, Phillips Theological Seminary uh, called One From Many. Um, but that kind of has also phased out. So in its stead, we're still doing many of our study groups and partnerships of that kind. Um, and we're kind of leaning on Phillips Theological uh, as to the, the next steps on the One From Many conversations. That transitioned into more of like a prayer, um, a, a interfaith prayer kind of conversation rather than a discussion. Um, but with the interfaith tour, um, that is open to adults as well. So we, if you're not familiar with that one, it takes young people particularly, but also adults uh, to the various different faith centers, religious centers across the state, uh, across the city. Um, this past year, we went to uh, Congregation Bene Muna, um, Antioch Baptist, and then Phil, can you help me? And you remember what the last one was? Ah, yes, um, the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints on Harvard, um, not Harvard, Haven, North Haven, New Haven. 
Um, so we did that this last year. Um, and we're also building up connections with the Baha'i community as well as the Hindu and Buddhist um, temples that are also here in the city. And we give young people an opportunity to realize and explore the religious diversity that exists in the state without necessarily proselytizing or trying to evangelize there. And then teen trialogue, um, again, like I said, is a young people's version of trialogue, but with the same theme. So we bring young people together to have conversations around a topic. This year's topic is what do our faith traditions say or how do they define diversity, equity, and inclusion um, from the perspective of various faith traditions. So that one is pending reschedule. Um, it was scheduled for February 25th, but we needed to move that date further out with all of the religious things that are happening within the next two months. So. Those are our interfaith pieces that we have as of right now. Does that answer your question, or are there more percolations that I didn't hit at? Okay, okay, awesome. Any other questions, thoughts? I, I think that, um, I don't know if that's a separate thing. We have a, we have an, um, we have a staff person. We're not maintaining a physical office. Would you say that that's right, Phil? Yeah. So we, um, at this time, don't have an office there, but we do have a staff person who's based in Oklahoma City um, with, I anticipate, intentions to increase that number in the coming years. Yeah. Okay. Let me quickly go through this. I hear the music starting, so I don't want to keep you all from worship. Okay. So why I left? So um, the um, tenor, the tone of any town is to create intentionally inclusive communities. The idea is that if you're intentional about it, any place can be any town, right? Which is why it's called any town, okay? Um, that, that essence is carried across all of these other programs. So we intentionally bring people together with the goal of creating those inclusive spaces for everyone. The Youth Leadership Forum was started in 2020 following the murder of George Floyd, recognition that young people needed a safe space to talk about race-related issues, um, especially as it relates to the legacy of Greenwood Rising, um, the legacy of the Tulsa Race Massacre and Greenwood Rising, which had just been completed around that time. And so we have young people use that as a backdrop to talk about similar instances of oppression and hate in their communities. And they have an opportunity to do an action plan and execute on that action plan. And if they're successful in their community, um, they get a $200 check from us as a thank you for leaning into the action planning process to their own youth agency. We've had projects based on um, decreasing bullying in schools. We've had projects around um, inequitable dress codes in schools that young people have put together and actually created change in their school, which is really exciting. So that's what that program looks like in Tulsa. Last year, we also executed it for the first time in Oklahoma City with a specific focus on the legacy of Clara Looper. If you all are familiar with her, and the work that she did with young people as it relates to the sit-ins and the start of the civil rights movement here in the state of Oklahoma. And again, we provide them that $200 gift card if they're successful in completing their action project. So that's, that's a really exciting program. It's shorter than any town. Um, it's over the course of a couple weekends, but that's what that program is. Um, ILI is our adult version of any town, if you wanna think about it that way, the Inclusive Leadership Institute. It's three days virtual, but we do provide, just like any town, opportunities for the adults who go through that program to get together and meet in person afterward. Many of them come to our annual dinner. Many of them also volunteer with us. We also do panels where we can engage with them after that program as well. But again, an adult version of any town with a focus on the workplace. So how can my workplace be the place that supports me? And then we also have a leadership and inclusion workshops as well. So these are ranging from anything related to um, diversity, equity, inclusion foundation. Let's just define those words as a community, as a group. And we also do um, unconscious bias conversations. We do custom workshops. I've created a few on creating inclusive classrooms, what that looks like, as well as um, the history and legacy of systemic oppression. Actually, I came early, I was having a conversation with the uh, site connector for Be The Neighbor. Um, you all hosted them last summer. Um, 
With Be the Neighbor, we did a systemic oppression workshop for their youth as well. So it was specifically tailored to young people, that conversation. Um, so I enjoy all, doing all of it. If you have any questions about any of it, <laughs> please let me know. Um, but that kind of encompasses the gist of our work, as Phil was saying, uh, programs is the heartbeat of the organization. It's kind of the essence of what we do. So, um, And again, it's my honor to be able to do it for the sake of the community. Are there any questions? Other questions that I didn't get to? Yeah. It, it just seems to me that with this uh, negative talk about DEI, uh, which I will never, ever, ever understand, uh, that your work is becoming increasingly important and that, I guess this is really not a question, but it seems to me that people like us, maybe people like our class, need to step up and be supportive of this, uh, of this cause. Thank you for what you do. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and we, we would love, just as a kind of capstone to that point, love to get maybe five youth a perfect young person to go through any town as any young person, particularly if they are struggling with um, finding their voice, right? Um, they have this voice, but maybe they need a supportive adult. Um, maybe they need to have a conversation with another young person who can resonate with something they're going through, someone they would have never otherwise met. Um, maybe they need just a little bit of um, energy and support that, that any town can provide them. So if you all know five young people who would fit that margin, feel free to send them directly to me. I love talking to young people about the program. I can give them more ins and outs details than what I shared with all of you. Um, so that's also something I'd be happy to do. I can text them, call them. That's sometimes easier than meeting in person for young people these days with how busy they are. So I just want that to be said. Um, Phil, do you have anything that you want to add? I'll just say on, on the tail end of that, uh, the, the, the climate that we're in, and especially you know, with the fact that the presidential uh, election this year, it, it's, <clears throat> I, I remember sharing with, with my staff many times, la even going in about August, September, I was kind of preparing even our board, and I would say next year, this year, is going to be probably the most vitriolic year when it comes to a presidential election and anybody doing this type of work are going to be the punching bag. Uh, the narrative of what DNI is has been taken over by an extreme view and this is categorized under this huge umbrella of woke. They've gone woke. Um, and so what I want to reassure you with is that presidents of organizations, companies from the Pierce Nortons of One Oak uh, to the leadership of Quick Trip to every major company and corporation that I've had a chance to talk to over the last few months continue to say, I cannot survive, my company will not survive unless I create an environment where everyone feels acknowledged and embraced. Um, I cannot get rid of DEI. Now, because of the political winds and their power, I may not be able to I may have to change the name of it, unfortunately, I may, but I'm never going to stop this work. Um, and so the work continues, but how we approach it may be differently. And it does make this work just ever more challenging. And that's why we're doing more of this, because what we used to be able to get is schools call us. I've got students to send you, you know, come by here, historically under Nancy Day. House Bill 1775 and other legislation. Uh, it, it's really intimidated teachers, it's intimidated schools to not say, well, I know this is a great program, but you can come and talk, but I really can't do too much because it's not worth losing my job. That's where we are. Um, so we need your help now more than ever. And um, Hannibal Johnson and Nancy Day, and I'll finish with this, the, the magic, part of the magic with, with uh, uh, any town is the strategic way of getting, and he, they would say, you want the, the quarterback that plays for Bixby to be in the same room with the kid that goes to Booker T or McLean. You want the kiddo that goes to the Muslim uh, church to be in the same room or to be in the same pod with the kid that goes to the Christian church or the Jewish synagogue. You want the LGBTQ affirming student to find out that they can make friends with someone who doesn't identify that way and still have connection. That getting those different students, black, white, religious affiliation, um, Native American, and have them spend that week, it is 
an amazing experience, and we need you to spread the word. So thank you. Thank you again. Is this program federal? And if not, why not? So his question was uh, if this is a federal. So we are a 501c3, and you know the primary source of our, the way we do it, is by from donations, uh, donations from the public. Uh, but we do not have any government contracts, federal contracts. We're looking at some of that. Uh, Taz is really good with that because he served and worked in the Public Policy Institute for Oklahoma. But right now, we are totally privately funded foundations, organizations, and do not have funding from federal organizations from from the federal government this time. Great question. No? So what is the deadline for your students to apply? Because, yeah, you, okay, thanks. We need to know that if we're going to recruit. Anybody, any other questions, Bob? Well, thank, you all so much again. thank you, Phil and Kara. We really appreciate it. Thank you for your message. <laughs>